welcome to the Cato Institute. I am Jason Kuznicki, editor of Cato Books and Cato Unbound. And uh, we are here today to talk about Panic Attack, Young Radicals in the Age of Trump by Ravi Swabi. And uh, I found this a very interesting read, I have to say. This book was uh, very thought provoking in that it ranged all over the ideological spectrum and treated many, many different phenomena, if you will, uh, all under a common rubric. And it prompted in me the question, well, what, what are the commonalities here? Why is it that it seems like so many people have simultaneously lost their minds? <laughs> uh, and, and I'm here today in part because I care a great deal about the fine art of not losing your mind and uh, asking questions about how do we return to a somewhat more sane place in our politics. And uh, one of the things that this book highlighted, at least for me, is that all of these phenomena seem to be happening in two main locations. One of them is the campus environment, and the other is, of course, social media. So what do these two environments have in common? I would like to offer three answers. Perhaps our panelists will have their own or will have responses to mine. But my three answers, at least, are as follows. First, there's the Tocqueville effect. The Tocqueville effect is a well-known phenomenon in political science where when a society undertakes to reform itself, that is often precisely the moment at which conditions seem even more intolerable. That is to say, when some positive social change occurs, things somehow end up seeming worse. And there have been, I think, a number of positive social changes in recent years. Uh, gay and lesbian people have met with, finally, social acceptance and equality, and I regard that as a positive development. We have had a great deal of racism in our past, and there is much evidence nowadays that, in fact, it has greatly lessened, and that's wonderful, and we ought to be happy. And somehow we're angrier than ever before. And we have seen a resurgence, perhaps, of some degree of racism, but also we have seen a remarkable scrupulousness about things that seemingly didn't used to be racist. And that's puzzling and, uh, and certainly one of the subjects of this book. Uh, we've seen things that were formerly regarded as, as watershed moments or as, as uh, significant positive developments being recast as, in fact, negative. One example that uh, Robbie talks about is the film Boys Don't Cry, which was, in fact, a trans-affirming film, one that talked about how uh, transgender people ought to be treated perhaps better than they actually are. And nowadays, that film is considered problematic by many trans activists for, uh, for reasons that, uh, at the time, were not considered problematic at all, namely a cisgendered actress playing the lead role. So the Tocqueville effect has something to do with it, I think. A second, second point I would suggest is that both in college environments and on social media, there is a strong incentive to play to one's home audience. Find something bad from outside your group and condemn it in front of your group. And you raise Second your own point, I would suggest social that esteem, you raise your own standing within college environments and on social media. And so it seems simultaneously we are all attempting to do this each to our social groups. And condemn it in front of your and in the book, Charlie Kirk, the noted conservative activist, is quoted as saying, the left hates the idea that there are other ideas. But as a libertarian, it's my experience that this is the case with pretty much everyone. So on social media, we all self-segregate. And on campuses, too, there's a strong community of ideological self-segregation. 
And that, I think, is why it seems like we are all so angry now. We are all finding the worst from the other side and presenting it to our own side and trying to raise our own social standing with our, within our own groups. And this is a dangerous dynamic. I don't see the end of it. I don't know, I don't know how we pull out of this. And third, the third dynamic that I think is very similar on social media and on college campuses is the presence of at least potential gatekeepers. I am just old enough to remember the pre-social media internet. And it was great. <laughs> there weren't any gatekeepers. Yes, there were Nazis. Yes, there were environmental terrorists. Yes, there were all sorts of crazy, abominable people out there. We all knew that they existed and they weren't on our blog, and that was great. That was enough. That was all we needed to be happy. They were out there, we were here, we're okay. But when there are gatekeepers, suddenly everyone's politics changes. Everyone changes to try to capture the gatekeepers, to make the gatekeepers take our side, and to keep the other people out. And I think that that is something that social media has brought to the online experience that was not present before its arrival. That uh, in the social media age, as opposed to the internet before social media, we now have the prospect of gatekeepers. And everyone is trying to play to or perhaps become the new gatekeepers. So those were three of the many, many thoughts that I have had while reading this book. And I am sure that our panelists, whom I will now introduce, will have many more of their own. First, of course, the author, Robbie Suave, associate editor at Reason. Uh, he is a commentator in many different venues. His work at uh, Rolling Stone, reporting sexual assault alleged at the uh, University of Virginia, won him a 2015 Southern California Journalism Award. As a columnist for the Daily Beast, his writing appeared, he's a columnist for the Daily Beast. His writing also appeared at the New York Times, the New York uh, Post, CNN, USA Today, and Newsweek. In 2016, he was named in Forbes 30 under 30 list for law and policy. And he is a regular guest on Fox News, CNN, and various syndicated radio programs. So uh, he will speak first. Next up will be Jane Koston, who is a senior politics editor at Vox.com, with a focus on conservatism, the GOP, and also the far right. She is a co-host of the popular Vox media podcast, The Weeds, and her work has been featured in the New York Times, ESPN Magazine, and various other venues. And lastly, Greg Lukianoff is an attorney, New York Times best-selling author, and the president and CEO of the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education. He's the author of Unlearning Liberty, Campus Censorship, and the End of American Debate, Freedom of Speech, and Fire's Guide to, the, uh, uh, Fire's Guide to Free Speech on Campus. Most recently, he co-authored The Coddling of the American Mind, How Good Intentions and Bad Ideas Are Setting Up a Generation for Failure. This New York Times bestseller expands on an earlier September 2015 Atlantic cover story that he did with his co-author, Jonathan Haidt. He is finally the executive producer of Can We Take a Joke? A feature length documentary that explores the collision between comedy, censorship, and outrage culture, both on and off campus. Please welcome our panelists. Yes. Thank you all so much for, uh, for coming here today. Is this on? Can you hear? Okay, yeah. Um, thank you all for being here. So the subject of my book, Panic Attack, Young Radicals in the Age of Trump, is uh, the culture of activism um, at the moment we kind of occupy right now, particularly on college campuses, where uh, a number of progressive activists, um, particularly, particularly at elite educate educational institutions um, have been engaged in, in 
attempts to shut down um, visiting speakers who they may disagree with, uh, professors who may actually be very well to the left, who, who they object to something they've said in classroom and they call for investigations of them, um, group, other student groups whose activities they don't uh, agree with. Um, this is a problem uh, more uh, pervasive, I think, um, at, again, at, at places like Harvard and Yale, at liberal arts institutions. Uh, where the culture of a of not all students, not not most students, but a, a small number of, of very progressive kind of radical fringe uh, believes that ideas that they that they disagree with are not only uh, sort of objectionable in like a tactical political sort of uh, scheme, but represent a threat to their emotional well-being and their health, and thus should be these ideas should be unsayable on college campuses. Uh, this is a problem I think uh, the sort of national media started paying more attention to beginning in late uh, 2015 when there was a very notable event at, uh, at Yale, a dean of that college, Nicholas Christakis, um, I believe Greg was actually there for that event in a sort of twist of fate that you would not believe the writing of this season. They didn't believe uh, it. <laughs> Uh, the, uh, the Dean Nicholas Christakis, his, his wife uh, had, had written an email uh, to the students saying that uh, rejecting kind of previous guidance the administration had given the students, uh, warning them not to wear offensive Halloween costumes, and Christakis' wife had said, you're probably all adults, you can maybe decide for yourselves what's appropriate to wear for Halloween, and a, a number of students uh, rejected this, uh, this attempt to be not paternalistic and surrounded Christakis in the public square and berated him for a long time, uh, uh, asserting that it was his role on campus to provide uh, a safe space for them from, from discomfort, from emotional harm and that he had failed in his obligation to do that. And they said explicitly that that is the role of the administration is to provide us this, this overbroad safety from, from ideas and things that might trouble us. Um, this, is a, this is a kind of undercurrent of activism that has cropped up time and time again in, in the years uh, since this incident. Um, probably many of you are aware of, of some of the incidents that have attracted more uh, national attention. Uh, attempts at uh, Middlebury College to stop uh, a planned debate between the conservative uh, uh, thinker Charles Murray and a, a liberal economist, Alison Stanger. Um, the activists actually attacked, not only prevented the event from taking place, but ended up putting uh, Ms. Stanger in a neck brace. Um, ev uh, events at uh, Berkeley, uh, uh, attempts by conservative students to bring provocative far-right speakers resulted in smashed windows, uh, trees being set on fire, um, uh, the events not taking place. Uh, this is not just happening, does not happen just to far right uh, kind of uh, people, but, uh, but also to leftist professors. People like Brett Weinstein and Laura Kipnis uh, are two notable examples of, of, of very progressive academics whose, own, whose, whose students objected to, to, to something they thought or something they did, and in Kipnis's case, uh, launched uh, uh, harassment complaints that had her I investigated. Um, th this continues to, uh, to today, just, just in, the, in the news in the last uh, few weeks. A law professor at, uh, at Harvard University, Ron Sullivan, who is uh, well known for his, for his expertise on criminal justice reform, he was, I believe, an advisor at one point to uh, Senator Obama. Uh, he has represented uh, and helped to, to free wrongfully incarcerated, uh, tons of wrongfully incarcerated people. And he has uh, represented, as, as you do if you're, a, if you're a defense attorney, he's represented all sorts of very controversial clients, accused murderers, accused terrorists even. But he is now, uh, he was briefly uh, in this sort of last semester going to represent Harvey Weinstein. Uh, the, uh, who has been Me Too'd, who is credibly accused of, of uh, sexual harassment and assault. So uh, the activist students, about 50 of them, had protests, and they said that, that Sullivan, uh, representing Weinstein, made the campus unsafe for women, uh, that they, this, this, would be, this should be impermissible. Uh, Harvard investigated Sullivan and decided to uh, fire him as, uh, not as a law professor, but as faculty dean of uh, one of the residential colleges. And he actually had a great op-ed in the New York Times just yesterday um, saying that uh, he is very concerned about the emotions of students at many elite institutions being taken so seriously that they are now dictating uh, the policies and overriding uh, values that the left 
used to, uh, used to believe very strongly in values of free expression and due process. So that was, those two uh, are areas where libertarians and progressives have historically been in close uh, proximity. Uh, they're, they're, I have tremendous respect for the work, for instance, the ACLU has done over the years uh, to defend the rights of despicable people uh, to defend their free speech and their due process rights. Uh, but even the ACLU now is sort of out of step with where activist culture is. At William & Mary, just I believe two years ago, uh, a member of the ACLU attempted to speak to students and a group of activist students associated with the local Black Lives Matter group um, shut this woman's speech down. They, they, they talked over her to prevent it from happening. Uh, eventually, the organizer of the event simply gave the mic to the leader of the student activists to let them have their own, uh, have their event uh, instead. And they, and they, they shouted that the ACLU is, is, is a white supremacist organization, that liberalism itself is white supremacy for, uh, for, for believing, I guess, that even bad people like white supremacists should have, should have rights. Um, again, this is so different uh, I, from where the left was um, decades ago. Berkeley was the birthplace of the free speech movement. In, in research for my book, I actually learned that in 1963, the, uh, the left, the far left, very progressive student group invited a Nazi to campus to make a free speech point. Um, and they dressed in full Nazi regalia to promote the event. And then this, this man, this, this guy spoke, and no one heckled him, no one shut him down. They just laughed at him. They laughed at him when he was done. And, uh, and, and this was, this, again, this was something that the, the progressive students did to say that, no, we are for ironclad free speech. Um, can you imagine uh, if this happened today? Campuses would be shut down. There would be national days of mourning. Uh, there, there would be talk of how the mental health uh, of the entire campus was negatively impacted by this to the point where no one can go to classes and no one can take their exams. Um, so, so this is the kind of... That's a survey of kind of the, uh, the, the problems um, I'm, I describe in my book, and, and then I, I talk about different activist groups um, that have been active over the last 10 years, and specifically what some of their goals are. Um, but I, to keep it uh, without getting too, I think, hyper-specific on that, um, I'll just very briefly talk about uh, kind of the trends, I think, linking these groups and maybe uh, contributing to them choosing these tactics. So when I, uh, when I spoke to some of these activists for the book, um, uh, specifically at uh, University of Michigan, uh, where Jane is also a University of Michigan grad, so we're, we're a heavy Michigan uh, uh, bunch here. Um, and they were, uh, they, uh, this was another event where Charles Murray was supposed to speak, and they were planning to uh, prevent him from speaking. And, uh, you know, I, I, I would say things to the activists like, well, don't you think this makes uh, Charles Murray looked more sympathetic, and you look very sensitive or, or very foolish for, for, for thinking that he can't even be allowed to speak. Um, but what they told me then and what they, they told me over and over again in the research I did for this book was that, well, if you let someone speak who makes people feel, who people disagree with uh, on campus, who are, mar are the marginalized on campus uh, feel uncomfortable, then you've essentially allowed violence to take place. So we are committed to not having these uncomfortable conversations with people who are, who, uh, or, or allowing people who are non-leftists to speak on campus, uh, because the result of that will be uh, trauma for people, uh, mental trauma. And, and that exists on sort of the same spectrum as physical violence, which obviously the campus is obligated to prevent. Thus, uh, our tactics are justified, not only justified, but necessary to protect people's lives and their health. Um, I, I think that's a, that's a new uh, uh, sort of trend in, uh, in activist culture that uh, poses a, a complication uh, for those of us who believe campuses should remain places where difficult conversations can and must take place, uh, places where uh, a range of ideological uh, viewpoints should be aired and discussed, uh, places where professors should have wide latitude to tackle uh, difficult subjects um, in their classroom without fear of their students um, uh, uh, complaining to administrators and having them investigated uh, for saying something they disagree with. Just, so just yesterday I was talking to a friend of mine who, who is in education policy for a think tank, and she said she, was, she had just talked to a professor that she's uh, uh, friends with, and the professor was horrified. He has a, a review pending for him. He's being investigated because at the start of class, 
uh, one of his students, a female student, announced that um, she is now uh, not on the gender binary and she would like to be identified with they, them uh, pronouns, uh, which he was perfectly willing to do, but because this was the first, this was news to him, during the course of the classroom discussion, he, want, he slipped up accidentally and said she instead of they, um, not intentionally at all. Uh, this, the, the student left the classroom and went straight to the administration to report this, and this person's being investigated. Um, so there's a, there's a climate of, uh, of I think, um, of maybe seeking out self-victimhood um, on campuses because there is authority that stems from, from being the most marginalized or the most victimized uh, person. Um, the kind of uh, philosophy, I think, the intellectual trend that enhances that way of thinking is something called intersectionality, which is, vi which is uh, of just incredible importance to activists uh, uh, nowadays. Uh, the term comes from a sociologist uh, who, who coined it in the late 1980s to describe um, that, that so if, if you, you can have different sources of oppression wor working against you. If you're a woman, you might suffer from sexism. If you're a person of color, from racism. But if you're a woman of color, then you have sexism and racism uh, intertwined against you. So there's nothing wrong with the theory. Obviously, that makes perfect sense. Uh, but many of these activists uh, on campus have then added uh, all sorts of other categories. We have gender identity, gender expression, sexual orientation, ability, disability status, age, size, et cetera, et cetera. Many of these things are indeed sources of oppression for these people, but if you're asking everyone to be sort of worked up again, uh, uh, about all of them at the same time, and you're also saying that we only want to work from an activist perspective with people who fully agree on each one of these categories, um, you've narrowed down sort of the range of like people who are okay or in good standing with you to be a very small, tiny uh, fringe. And in fact, many of the activists I spoke to for this book said that the Women's March, uh, right after, the, I forget if it was the day before or the day after the Trump inauguration, you know, when hundreds of thousands of people marched on DC uh, to object to Trump's truly appalling uh, history of statements about and treatment of women, um, the activists I talked to said they hated that. They hated that whole march. It was all bad. Why? Because it was not run and organized by a coalition of the most oppressed. The people uh, running it were only checked off maybe one or two boxes. They were not, they were not trans women of color. They were just women running the event. Um, I think that is uh, my criticism of this. Again, not as that this theory is wrong, but that this can be uh, self-defeating and self-cannibalizing for the left. Uh, that, in addition to no longer sort of upholding free speech and due process, um, is sort of a recipe for, I think, disaster. And my concern is that these values, while they have played out on college campuses, um, are, have, are permeating social media, maybe media companies as well. And moving forward, um, if these are the values of not just sort of elite campuses where, okay, that's not real life anyway, it doesn't matter, uh, but now it's moving to real life and, and firms and organizations are going to have to reorient their policies around the demands of, again, a small, tiny subset of, of politically engaged young people, um, you're going to have a very hard time having people who disagree or having uncomfortable discussions in the workplace, in broader society, uh, because this is explicitly what these activists uh, want. Um, so I think I'll leave it there, and I'll turn it to, to Jane. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this panel. Um, just for correction's sake, I am not an editor yet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a reporter. Um, and I wanted to start out by talking about, you know, I write predominantly about conservatism on the right and the GOP. And something I think that was particularly interesting, and I think part of why I'm on this panel, is because we could have a riotous discussion across ideological barriers, because I've been working on a lot of pieces about how a lot of the, you know, the biggest sources of oppression of speech taking place on college campuses are not inherently coming from college students. They're coming from outside entities. They're coming from someone, say, Chris Kobach, who a couple of years ago was so offended at a piece of art featuring an American flag with a tiny sock on it that he demanded that the flag be destroyed, and it had to be removed, and it, someone had to do something about it. 
And I thought that that was a particularly telling incident because Kobach and a host of other Republicans have really championed the idea that they are stalwarts of free speech and free expression and the alternative is leftist orthodoxy. It turns out everyone has a form of speech that they themselves find deeply offensive and would rather you not do. Everyone. You know, I'm. Right now, my biggest obsession is currently over this co current conversation we're having about social media companies and whether or not they're too big and what they allow and what they don't allow. And right now, uh, Senator Josh Hawley out of Missouri is proposing to amend Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act so that social media companies would need to submit to the FTC, the unelected commissioners of the FTC, verification that the moderation policies that those companies use is neutral based on no one knows what. And so something I think it's important to note, and I, I, I'm glad I think Robbie made this point here, and he actually makes it on page 278 of his book, saying that the activists who are engaging in these illiberal activities, elsewhere their rage doesn't matter as much. And I think that that's really important here to be very clear about when we're talking about college students, we're not talking about all college students. There are millions of people in college and most of them aren't at Middlebury or Yale or Berkeley or even Michigan, unfortunately. <laughs> you know, they're attending community colleges that are dealing with major funding issues. They're attending smaller institutions, bigger institutions where the instances of speech are really complex. And I also think that this gets to you know, the growth of the administrative state on college campuses, which is, I think, a, you know, that's a topic of conversation I find fascinating. You know, kind of the idea that you would hire someone to be an expert in diversity, which, you know, I'm, I'm kind of surprised no one has asked me as a noted expert in being diverse. <laughs> but, you know, I think that how we talk about these issues is just as important as the issues we're talking about. You know, as Robbie said, it's not most students, it's not all students. When I was a student at the University of Michigan, I was also uh, working in a dining hall washing dishes. Um, that was my student job. I washed dishes for four years. And so my, I remember my own experiences of campus activism, which at the time were um, there was a group on campus, uh, BAM, By Any Means Necessary, which I think you reference in the book, um, that was very upset about uh, efforts to end affirmative action on campus. But they also came from uh, Young, Amer Young Americans for Freedom, which when I was on campus hosted, you know, Catch an Illegal Immigrant Day, and would, you know, protest events and host affirmative action bake sales. And, you know, it was, it seemed as if that they were kind of, you know, if you remember the spy versus spy cartoons, occasionally you had moments where you're like, I think you guys are just the same people. You just keep switching and then leaving. And so I think it's important to recognize that the culture of campus activism, both on what we think of as the left and what we think of as the right, and, you know, I'm obsessed with definitions. And so when people say that, you know, I'm right-leaning, which is why I think the government should regulate social media companies. I, mean, I have a couple of more questions about this. But I think it's really important to recognize that the culture of activism more broadly on college campuses, I think that's something that's worthy of having this conversation. It's not necessarily that you know, campus activists on the right and the left are doing activism wrong. They are doing activism in the way that colleges have kind of created the atmosphere to do it. You know, it's difficult when you're on a college campus and you're aware that outside of your college campus you have virtually no power to change minds about anything. No one wants to listen to you. No one, you know, your politics are fungible and changeable as they are for everyone on campus. But if you're on a college campus right now, you're on a college campus in which, you know, the Republican Party controls the White House, uh, currently controls the Senate, and controls the vast majority of state houses that determine how colleges receive funding. And that's been a giant issue in a lot of states, including Wisconsin, where massive cuts to state education have taken place based under the aegis of Republican administrations. And so I think if you're on a college campus right now and you are you know, interested in a particular issue, there is a strong drive towards a type of a liberal radicalism because the alternative seem almost unworkable. You know, when there is no, when you have no space to make actual change, you do get into this kind of spy versus spy of just kind of what I would call 
I think that you know, some people use the term like virtue signaling, but it's kind of activism signaling. You know, when it's talking about um, white people in a certain way, or even um, Charlie Kirk's Turning Point USA creating a professor watch list, and, you know, where you could report professors for being mean or leftist. Um, you know, I think that that is that kind of activism signaling. You know, it is this idea, when you get down to it, when you, you know, when I talk to kids on college campuses or I talk to college students, there's very much of this idea of like, no, we don't, we don't actually want to do this, but this is the only way anyone is going to listen to us. You know, it's kind of the idea that, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, so to speak. It's the person who's saying things like, we should kick all white people off this college campus who gets listened to by national media. And I, 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 you know, I have a couple of words on how national media covers college issues, because generally it is like, let's send a, a bunch of reporters over here to talk to the loudest person, when the person who's over here saying, you know, I'm working two jobs to pay off the, my college loan debt, so I can't really get involved in campus activism, that person's not getting heard from, even though there are far more more of that person there are, than there are of yelling, screaming person. So I think I want us to be incredibly careful about how we talk about college students. There's very much of a tendency in our politics to, you know, cast a wide, you know, cast aspersions towards a wide swath of people, and then when those wide swath of people object, say things like, well, we didn't mean you. <laughs> well, in this case, when we're talking about college students, let's be extremely clear about who we are talking about. We are talking about an extremely small group of people whose activism is largely the result of how activism is created on college campuses and how it has been for a really long time. You know, in the early 1970s, at the same time that you know, African American student groups were taking over college campuses, Richard Nixon was assembling a black cabinet to talk to him about how to reach African American voters, then disassembling it and then essentially arguing you know, for the placement on the Supreme Court of someone who relatively recent to that point said that segregation and white supremacy should be the law of the land. So it isn't new that the events on college campuses are relatively divorced from the events of the politics that, will, that impact those college students most forthrightly. But I also think it's important, and I'm really glad that Robbie raised these issues, because I think it's important what he does in the book is that he talks to these students. And he talks to them in a way that listens to them. You know, he's talking to trans people who, after the Women's March, felt kind of like they were being pandered to. And I think that that's, and they talked to African American students on campus who's, who felt like a lot of the efforts on campuses towards diversity are just basically to hire another diversity coordinator and not really do anything about the, you know, the issues that meant that you know, I remember when I was at Michigan and someone said to me, you know why all these black kids are here. And I was very interested to hear what their answer would be. And apparently it was sports, which I, you know, no one had told me that that's why I was at the University of Michigan and I was so thrilled to find out. And I, you know, I really appreciate Robbie for talking to students because a lot of times when we're having these conversations, even right now, we're talking about college kids. We're not talking to them. I really encourage us especially for those of us who are getting further and further away from our own college experiences, which I think sometimes we can start remembering with this kind of halo of, you know, we were just having civilized debates over glasses of Prosecco, when that's not, that's, that's not what you were doing. Don't lie. But I want us to be careful that we're talking about millions of people, and now we're also talking about a very small group of campus activists whose activism is created by the environment it's in. And I want us to be really fair to those students, and I want us to be really fair about the issues that they're dealing with. And I think I'd like to close by, I think that the biggest point of disagreement I have with the book, sorry, Robbie, <laughs> no is you know, there is an argument towards the end that liberal activism, uh, or left-leaning activism, could push people towards the open arms of the alt-right. And I want to be, you know, I think that that's an argument that's been made historically. You know, I was interested, uh, Robbie spoke to Richard Spencer, the noted white supremacist, um, who spends a lot of time on college campus for, campuses for someone who was born in 1978. 
Um, normally, people try to look down on that kind of thing. But you know, he's following in a tradition. You know, the founder of the American Nazi Party, George Lincoln Rockwell, went on a college tour in the early 1960s. And you can go look up his speeches at Michigan State University. And his entire point was saying, that, you know, any effort to protest me is saying, is pushing people towards me. Any effort to try, to try and stop my expression of free speech is just pushing people towards me. All I'm asking is for you know, the sharing of ideas and a civil discourse. But then, in an interview with Alex Haley, author of Roots in Playboy magazine, George Lincoln Lock Rockwell was a little bit more clear. He said repeatedly, I hate niggers. I hate them. I hate the niggers and the Jews. The Jews are controlling the niggers. That's what George Lincoln Rockwell's message was. And I think that it's extremely clear, for, it's extremely clear that people do not wind up in the alt-right because of the illiberalism of the left. That is to take away the personal responsibility that should be the, you know, the, you know where conservatism should be making its bread, so to speak. You know, I think it's incredibly important for us to remember that people do not join political entities because they were pushed to do so. You know, the people who sent so many Jewish and non-Jewish journalists gas chamber images, were not, they did not do so because a professor at the University of Missouri was illiberal. They did so because they decided to do so. They did so because they decided to engage in a liberalism themselves. And so I want to be really clear about that, that you know, there are a host of people who have been responded to by folks on the left with cruelty and liberalism and you know, on social media or on college campuses and did not decide, you know who looks great right now? Richard Spencer <laughs> in his stupid suit. And I think that you know, we should give college students more credit than that. And I think that we should be thinking about how we can talk to college students about these issues and not just be talking about them. And again, thank you, Robbie, for writing this book. Hi, uh, my name is Greg Lukianoff. Um, I put all my notes on my phone, so I'm not just tweeting while I'm uh, holding my phone and looking at it right now. Um, you know, there's a lot of ground I'd like to cover, um, I'm, uh, but I also really like to get the questions. I think one of the most inter interesting stuff happens anyway. Uh, but this year is the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education's 20th year. And I've been with FIRE for about 18 years of that. Um, actually cl close to 19 now. Um, and I went to law school to be a First Amendment lawyer. Um, this, it, it, it's always been what I wanted to do with my life. And um, it's been, uh, watching what's changed on campus since I started at FIRE back in 2001, it has been pretty dramatic. But, but I, wanna, I wanna say where I, I, I agree um, on, on some things first. Um, one thing I want to say is I, I agree with Jane on an awful lot of what she said. Um, the, the, the fire uh, fights threats from the right on campus all the time. Um, since, frankly, there aren't that many people on the right, um, you know, among professors, for example, a lot of times those threats come from off campus, uh, and those are come from legislatures. But, you know, Tennessee legislature, North Carolina legislature, Texas legislature, um, when they're on the wrong side of it, um, and we've seen a lot more of that in, in the recent past, uh, that, that's, been, that's been a real fight, uh, and they're kind of hard to defeat. I actually had a lot of fun uh, back in 2008 getting to defense, defend Richard Dawkins against the Oklahoma legislature. He wanted to speak at University of Oklahoma, and legislators there tried to pass a, a, a sense of, uh, of le the legislature or something like that, saying that evolution is an unproven, unpopular theory, uh, which was, which was kind of like, it was so old-timey. I really kind of enjoyed getting to do these, um, uh, you know, fights right out of the 1920s. Um, and one thing that I also think Jane is right about is that uh, the, the, the media bias is not exactly what you would think. Um, as someone who has been, uh, it's kind of funny, I was talking to a younger person and he, and, and he was kind of like, oh yeah, you know, free speech on campus stories, those are easy to get in front of the media. And I'm just like, yeah, as of 2015, maybe they were, um, but try doing that in 2008. Oftentimes with st stories as horrifying as the ones we're as the ones we're seeing today. So I wrote this book called Coddling of the American Mind with sociologist Jonathan Haidt, um, and we have a lot of examples of students of professors on the left getting in trouble in there in there as well, um, and and including one uh, named Lisa Durden who was actually fired. <coughs> 
from her job at a university in New Jersey um, after going on Tucker Carlson and defending a uh, black, black Lives Matter party uh, where, where they only invited black students to it. Now, interestingly, she didn't go to that school and she didn't attend the party, but nonetheless, because the university was afraid that they would get hate mail for her defending this, um, she, she was fired from her job. Now, there, there are other people who, who uh, had to step down from their job in the book, but Lisa Durden's name doesn't come up that much. And so there's this really peculiar pattern that I've seen is that if something comports to a politically correct uh, uh, stereotype of political correctness run amok on campus, it gets well covered both by um, the right-leaning media and oftentimes weirdly by the left-leaning uh, media. However, if it's someone on the left getting in trouble um, on campus, that gets maybe some coverage, usually like someone saying, on some website, ha ha, look, the, the right do it too, to which those of us who work in free speech are like, no kidding, <laughs> like, everybody does this at some point. But amazingly, we have an awful, there's a big center of cases uh, that aren't particularly political at all, they get virtually no coverage. Um, last year we were fighting against Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute that actually told its students that it couldn't, um, that, that they were trying to dissolve the student union, they were trying to reduce professors' rights. They actually made the argument that due to eminent domain, students couldn't uh, protest on that campus. That doesn't make any sense, by the way. Like, that, that is a nonsensical argument. But meanwhile, this was one of the more straightforward abuses of student rights we've seen and systematic and gets virtually no coverage even though it's at a fairly elite college. So definitely, you know, I, I agree with a lot of what Jane said, but I do want to be clear here. Something did change in 2013, 2014, and it wasn't subtle, it wasn't slight, uh, it wasn't small, um, and it was quite dramatic. For my career starting in 2001, students were consistently the best constituency for free speech on campus, period. They were better than professors, which is a little bit sometimes of a surprise, and they were certainly better than administrators. Um, and then sometime around uh, in, the, uh, the, in the fall of 2013, we started seeing campus shoutdowns, we started seeing disinvitation pushes, we started seeing demands for trigger warnings and microaggressions, all happening within about the course of, of about six months. Um, and I was you know, getting calls from friends who were columnists and all this kind of stuff. We could take for granted that students were on the right side of these issues. For my entire career, I would talk to conservative organizations and explain, listen, students are actually generally good on freedom of speech. And something really dramatic happened, and I don't think it's a, actually a, 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 a very um, you know, particularly small number of, of, of students when it comes down to it are less positive about freedom of speech. Now, I do think there are reasons for that, not the least of which is that if you look at the Supreme Court cases over the last 15 years, they're kind of free speech advanced techniques. To understand why animal crush videos might be protected, um, you have to already, you have to give a lot of, of, of sort of credence to the long history and noble uh, intentions of freedom of speech. But I do think um, one thing that students just don't seem to know is that freedom of speech uh, exists to protect minority rights. Um, and I have to explain this almost like at, at a grade school level when I go and, and talk to students. And because they haven't heard this before. And I just have to explain, listen, in a, uh, in a democracy, um, freedom of speech uh, uh, um, of the majority is protected. If you have 51%, you have freedom of speech. You, you're, you're in favor with power. Or if you're uh, a favorite person of the king you know, in a, in a non-democracy. So since you're setting up a democracy, you only have to have freedom of speech for a numerical minority. Um, that's the only reason why you, why, why you need to have it. But the reason why students haven't um, experienced this is one, something we write about in Coddling the American Mind, polarization. We increasingly live in communities that are less politically homogeneous than they were several decades ago and, and getting worse. Meanwhile, um, in the uh, cyber sphere, you can be as um, isolated from people, your echo chamber can be thick, 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 thick in a way that simply was not possible um, in previous generations. You can spend all day reading opinions that, uh, the, the, that agree with you and, and still not get, get to all of them, um, it just produced in a single day. So that's definitely something that's happening outside of the university. But one thing, um, and FIRE is, you know, we're very nonpartisan, if anything our, our staff probably leans more to the left than the right. But, I will, but one thing that I've been hesitant to say, and I'm, and I'm, gonna, say, I'm gonna say here, is I do actually think that part of the reason why um, you are seeing some disillusionment with the concept of freedom of speech on campus is because of the political tilt of universities is dramatic. Um, and this was something, a point that Sam Abrams uh, at Sarah Lawrence University tried to make this argument. He made this argument in, in the New York Times saying that administrators lean even more to the left than university, um, uh, university professors. 
and students were t took over the president's office to protest and demand that he be fired. Thankfully, honestly, I think due to public pressure, the, 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 the firing him is currently off the table. Um, this is a really well-established point, and just uh, Sam wanted to go deeper, deeper into it. Um, the, the, the fact that professors lean decidedly to the left is something that I knew was bad, but it was only working with Jonathan Haidt that I was realizing that we're having some departments where it's 31 to 1 in, in history departments in some cases, and at some schools, literally no conservatives at all, let alone Trump voters, um, teaching in various departments. Now, what is, is that a problem by itself? Probably, Heterodox Academy was established to do that. But what it does, and I didn't fully appreciate, is it leads to people whose parents were used to the idea that if they were uh, pro progressive uh, students, that they would they'd make demands of the university and they would be told, you know, shut down this conservative group, they're really, they're really bothering me. Um, and they're told by the administration in, in the 1980s, no, I'm sorry, we can't, uh, freedom of speech. Um, and this has gone on for uh, a generation after, after generation. And after a while, it isn't really all that surprising that students start to go, oh, freedom of speech. When I lived in San Francisco, when I worked at the ACLU in San Francisco, um, even my friend, I, the people I went to Burning Man with for seven years, you know, had the impression that freedom of speech was, oh, that's that thing that prevents us from having hate speech laws, without recognizing kind of like, yes, and it also allows you know, my performance artist friends, you know, um, some, some of the ones who believe this stuff, to actually, to actually have their rights. So what it leads to is an impression that freedom of speech is the argument of three, three Bs, the bully, the bigot, and the robber baron, rich people. Um, this is completely skewed, as I have to point out when I talk on campus. By the way, rich people generally do well under pretty much every system except for communism. Um, like, people come to the robber barons, to the rich people. Um, uh, the, the kings come to them uh, asking for money uh, through, through, throughout history. Um, but we do have the skewed, skewed perspective, in part because universities are so skewed in, in, in a particular political direction. So um, basically, that, uh, what, what I really just want to say was well, I enjoyed Robbie's book. It was a little bit since I work in this field, and so many of the cases were cases that we talk about in Coddling the American Mind and, and that we deal with at FIRE. It was a little bit like having your own living room described to you at different, at different times. Um, but I am glad to see a lot of attention focused on this, and I do also very much like the fact um, that he sat down with students. If anything, if I do have a criticism of the book, I would have liked more um, in-depth discussion of who the individuals were. I think that would have been more, more, uh, more moving for me. But overall, I think it's a you know, good contribution to the discussion. Thank you. And now it's your turn to take part in the discussion. Uh, as moderator, I have some announcements. We make them all the time, but uh, I hope regulars will pardon me. First, please wait to be called on. Second, please wait for the microphone so that everyone in the room and audiences later may hear. Uh, third, please announce your name and affiliation. And fourth, please make it in the form of a question. No comments. <laughs> Make sure that they are actual questions so that we can have something to discuss up here. Thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, Matthew Hurt, Americans for Prosperity Foundation. So how do we solve the problem? Do I have to answer that? Yeah. <laughs> yep, it's your book, You man. wrote the book. Um, <laughs> wow. Um, so, I, I mean, if we're talking very narrowly about the problem of free speech on campus, uh, I mean, the, the, I think um, I'm against many of the heavy-handed solutions. The, I mean, there are attempts to sort of legislate solutions. Even President Trump declared a, declared a, a, a presidential executive order uh, to, to change the fund, re, how research, uh, research grants to universities unless they have good free speech, uh, it, it makes no sense how this would even work. Um, so I'm against all of those. Um, you know, I, I, I think when people in the university have stood up to the kind of fringe mob of students who want to shut down the event, um, they have been successful. Uh, when, when professors uh, need to feel more comfortable to criticize their students and not feel like they're going to be, like, uh, administrators are going to take seriously these investigations demands. There needs so there needs to be like a internal policy cultural shift 
um, where the faculty feels uh, comfortable exercising their full academic freedom, where students feel like and are encouraged to chat, you know, if you're at an event where the person, you want to hear the person speak, and a bunch of people, but a, a minority of the people in the room are, are trying to shout down the speaker, you can stand up and tell that person, no, I want to hear this. I've seen that kind of rob the power of the mob a little bit, um, and, and administrators doing that as well. You know, we don't have, have to necessarily have protesters dragged out of classrooms and, and, and handcuffed and arrested if administrators, faculty, and students representing, I suspect, a majority most of the time of people who want these events to actually take place, um, just stand up and declare that to be so. Um, you, can, you can have the power of the mob um, sort of uh, taken away a bit. I, really, can I, sure. I, I, I want to answer that partially because I, um, I wrote something about this just yesterday that I feel very strong about. It's really frustrating for me, and I find this particularly among conservative audiences. There is a sense that kind of like, what are we going to do? There's, there's nothing we can do about this free speech problem on campus. And it's kind of like, oh, God, OK. How many of you went to college? Raise your hand if you went to college. OK, so most of you, almost all of you. Um, OK, so uh, I, I published five things that you have to do. You have to contact your alma maters, and you have to ask your president to do these five really easy things he can do, or he or she can do. Um, stop violating the law. <laughs> <laughs> about 30% of schools have red light speech codes. About 90% of them have some kind of speech codes. Tell them to stop doing that. Um, you should have them to pre-commit, recommit to freedom of speech. The best way to do that is called the Chicago Statement, uh, produced by the University of Chicago, updating academic freedom standards for the for the new um, uh, for the new problems. About 63 colleges, I, or maybe maybe it's more like 70 at this point, have actually adopted the Chicago Statement. So your university president has no excuse. Um, when it, uh, number three, defend free speech rights of your students and faculty loudly and clearly. Um, presidents need your back. Um, they need to know that when, a, uh, when an unsavory or, or unpopular opinion comes up and they want that prof uh, pr uh, professor fired, just like Robbie said, if they come out strong and early and clearly, those, those, those cases tend to go away. Four, uh, teach, your, teach free speech from day one. Virtually no schools in the country have orientations that teach freedom of speech and academic freedom. Let that, think, let, let that sink in. Um, every school in the country has to have that before we throw up our hands. We can't blame students for not knowing something they've never been taught. And lastly, number five, uh, be scholars and collect data. Uh, it's really clear to me from speaking on campus that at more sort of working class um, uh, 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 campuses, uh, microaggressions, trigger warnings, these kind of like more culture war hot issues are just not all that big of, a big of a deal. Meanwhile, though, visiting Haverford, that was a school where at least my impression from talking to students was they had given up on disagreeing about things. So what we need are individual universities committing to actually uh, 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 collecting data about their own students and about how free they feel to, 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 to discuss their point of view on those campuses. Those are five really easy things that university presidents should do. I, I would also add um, that for students who do, you know, students will want to protest people who come to campus. Yes, absolutely. You know, and you know, I want to be extremely clear that like the existence of protest is not the issue. You know, if you've okay. got Richard Spencer, he showed up at Auburn and started talking about how you know you should shut down your football program because other like that's how you'll get all the black students off campus. Like he's not coming here there to like foment debate. Like <laughs> he's Richard Spencer. That's what he does. And I think if students are cognizant of that, you know, there have been some real successes I've seen on college campuses where you have a separate event somewhere else. Yep. You know, if Milo Yiannopoulos wants to come to your college campus and talk about feminism as cancer, make him talk to nobody. <laughs> that would, I, I don't even know if he exists if he can't be seen by other people. <laughs> and so I think that for students who want to protest, you know, with folks like Charles Murray or something like that, have an event on the bell curve and the issues contained within the bell curve and the problems surrounding that research or research. You know, talk about that in a separate avenue. I think that there's a sense, um, you know, we've kind of gotten into, and I, I'm a former sports writer, so I, pers I blame myself. We, <laughs> everyone has gotten the ESPN embrace debate. And I think that there's a sense that for a lot of these campus protesters at the root when I talk to kids on campus, this idea that like, well, if I say something, maybe the person I'm yelling at will change their mind. And that's not how this is going to work. But I think that there are ways to protest that don't violate anyone's rights to free speech. Because again, uh, you know, a right to speak is not a right to have someone else not say that you're an idiot. Yeah. And I think that you know, encouraging student protest to be like, you know, for, ev 
I've seen events where for every hour that uh, Identity Europa or Richard Spencer is on your campus, we will donate money to this fund for uh, undocumented immigrants or this fund for LGBT people. You know, there are lots of ways to protest, ways to protest that really irritate these people. Yes. And I think that there are a lot of ways to do that and encourage students to do that. Because, you know, I was, I was raised by activist hippies, and I was raised by activist hippies to go out and try and do something that would make, you know, that wouldn't give credence to the people I'd be protesting. And I think that there are lots of ways to protest that are more creative and more effective and don't result in the sympathy votes that I think a lot of these yes. speakers are brought to campus to get. Yep. You know, where you, know, you can have you know, some of these folks saying that like, ah, my free speech has been limited. Well, if they're speaking to an empty room, you gave them free speech. Yep. Yes. Thanks, uh, Robert Charetta. I, I wear two hats. I'm the president of International Investor, but I also happen to be the president of the board of a public access television station. And we learned, of course, that in the 60s, Congress passed the uh, a Communications Act that tried to provide a voice for people to state their views on any subject of their choosing. So we spend a lot of our time trying to defend people with a lot of radical views on all sides. But my, my question is, has there been a lack of leadership here, and what can we do to pressure people from educational associations, media organizations, constitutional or law organizations, and even members of Congress themselves to state a position regarding these rights of free speech? What can we do to pressure leaders to come forward and to really, uh, give voice to the idea that um, free speech still means something in our Constitution? Well, I'm, um, I mean, I'm wary in some cases of applying those pressures, especially if we're talking about to, to people uh, in Congress, to legislators, to lawmakers, because you, you, know, you present a problem to a lawmaker, they will, they want to solve it in ways that are often worse. I mean, I don't have to tell this to an audience of libertarians probably, <laughs> but uh, the, you know, the efforts to, I mean, right now, I mean, Jane and I have been talking about this a lot lately, like the efforts to um, solve the apparent, the perceived bias against right-leaning viewpoints on, in, uh, uh, on social media sites or in Google. Um, yeah, right, you can have a debate about whether there is a bias, um, but then also like, what should be done about it. And there's lots of people now, I mean, lawmakers, Josh, Senator Josh Hawley, uh, the Missouri senator, has come out with a proposal to change uh, Section 230, uh, which is a, a, a statute that gives uh, some protection to platforms, uh, uh, prevents, uh, protects them from being sued. Um, so like changing all, whether or not you think these entities are biased against conservatives, I, I mean, changing these policies would, would not help <laughs> would, would, uh, would not result in more conservative speech um, and would also just, I mean, invite the government to say who can say what. I mean, it would be a disaster. It would be something I think the right should, like, strongly oppose. Um, so I, I'm careful not to uh, recommend uh, or, or to talk to lawmakers specifically and say you need to do something about this because that's just a re recipe for disaster. The things Greg talked about, uh, you know, I, I agree with. Um, and also the things Jane talked about, about not, um, you know, we, we should support the right to protest, obviously. Some of these people on campus, I think, are not even worth protesting. Uh, Richard Spencer uh, and sort of his ilk. Uh, yes, if he delivers his remarks to an empty room, I think he perceives this as a defeat. Um, when there are, you know, when there are people trying to silence him, then, then he gets to say, or people like him get to say, why are you suppressing our ideas if they're so ridiculous? Uh, you know, what, what, are you, what are you trying to hide from people? And then there are some people, and, and I, I disagree a little bit with uh, Jane's remarks, I think there are some people who then see that and go, oh, well, why, why are people trying to hide this from me? Is there, there must be, maybe there's something to it. Maybe there's something to these kinds of alt-right beliefs if they're being suppressed to me. Um, I, I think there is maybe roughly a third of the people um, in these sort of like awful, deplorable far, far right circles who kind of got there. It's their fault. If you, it's your fault if you decide to be a Nazi. Obviously, it's no one else's fault. <laughs> but who kind of got there uh, from seeing uh, from from seeing these ideas so strongly suppressed 
um, or seeing the more mundane versions of them suppressed. That, again, like the things that Charles Murray thinks. And, and they see, well, well, if these two people are both being you know, characterized as Nazis or as, as having insane beliefs, and then when they actually find out Charles Murray's beliefs, I may quibble with them, but they're not totally crazy, um, then they think, well, these people have lied to me about what da what, whether or how dangerous these ideas are, and they, you end up going down a, a, a rabbit hole. So, um, so I, I, I would recommend to some, and there's a long history, uh, which I talk about a little bit in the book, of like Antifa type active shutdown activity, um, just calling more attention to some of the people they were shutting down because back, you know, if we're going like a hundred years ago, you would have no idea how to join like the like the far like the fascist group unless the newspaper was writing about it and describing their activities and where they meet and things like that. And the newspapers only had to do that if Antifa was like making news. Um, so so I, I while I absolutely support the right of the students to protest, uh, I think they need to be a little bit more choosy about what they are protesting. I would also, you know, I think it's really important that when we're talking about free speech, we're talking about all kinds of free speech. And I'm glad that you brought up public access television because public access television is where anyone, you can say whatever it is you want. And then, you know, when I talk to some folks, and I think there's an idea, I think I really appreciated your point about the three Bs regarding speech. Because I think that when I talk to students on the right, and you know, if I and I ask them like, do you think a speaker should be allowed to come to your campus and say something like, abortion is great and everyone should have one? They're like, no, <laughs> no, that would be bad. And you know, we've seen this a couple of times where you know, at, I believe it was at Texas State, a student wrote an editorial that basically said yep. like, all white people should die, which is bad. But uh, like the the risk, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. but the risk, you know, but the response, like people, are like you know, he has to be kicked out of school. He has to be like this would be terrible, and it's just like you know that this was his point, right? Like <laughs> one, you are giving this kid way more attention than he probably deserves. But just the, the the idea that like freedom of speech means the freedom of all speech, even like you know, I I've had Nation of Islam in my mentions a couple of times on Twitter, and you're like, I protect your mm -hmm. speech. It's insane speech, but it's speech that you're allowed to say, and I'm allowed to say, that's stupid. But I think that it's it's worth noting that you know I I really appreciate outlets like public access television and avenues where really the, like freedom of speech is one of those issues. I think for a lot of people they think you'll 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 say like, do you support free speech? And they're like, either they're college students that you're talking to, or you know for most people are like, absolutely. Right. But then you get down into you know those famous. Um, you know, the ACLU's ruling in, about Nazis marching in Skokie. Mm -hmm. Like, sometimes they are the Nazis marching in Skokie. Sometimes it is Westboro Baptist Church. Sometimes it is these, you know, crushing videos. Or like, sometimes these free speech issues are going to get really sure. gnarly. And it's going to be, you know, you're going to be permitting speech from people who hate you and wish you would die. But in our system, that speech being protected protects your speech, too. And I think it's really important to make that extremely clear that like we're talking about all forms of speech. Yep. And then just just really quickly, um, I really do want to stress because I because I do get a lot of like, what are we to do? Um, it's after commit yourself to after this session, go and write a short email as an alum to your alma maters or or, or graduate schools or whatever, and just say, listen, I think that they should. I think that you should teach about free speech. I think you should do do any of the following uh, the, the five things that we recommended that you should stand up for. I have your back because they and it, it's amazing how powerful. Even if you're not a donor to your alma mater, they really do care what you have to say. And I've been absolutely amazed at how. Fire cases have been won oftentimes by a handful or even one major donor um, or, or one, one, one alum who has sometimes a complete unknown who doesn't even donate money makes a difference. So don't feel disempowered on this. Go, go out and do something about it. Yes. Alyssa Edling from PEN America. Um, so this type of speech that you, Jane, have just been talking about where it's not exactly an incitement to violence, but it is like directly associated with the rhetoric that motivates hate crimes. Um, is there an affirmative non-restrictive way that campuses should be responding to that? Um, I'm wondering if perhaps responding in some sort of affirmative way may lessen the call for students to feel safe or have safe spaces. Um, what do you, you all think about that? Well, I mean, there. Well, I mean, 
there have been, I mean, when these things happen, they can't, the administrators tend to say, here is a room you can go to meet with mental health, or you can meet with mental health. You know, they, they, they're very conscious about advertising the mental health uh, facilities of the campus. And here's a place you can go to sort of chill out and talk with other people. And there's, I mean, they, they typically do this uh, uh, for like the, 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 the really far right um, uh, speakers. Um, but just, you know, and I just want to like make sure, we're, so we're, now we've gotten into the like, we're just talking about like the efforts to sort of censor like Richard Spencer type people. But like that, a lot of what I talk about the, in the book is also just efforts to censor benign people on the left who like there's not really anything. Like you, you mentioned the, um, uh, Greg mentioned the, um, or no, no, Jason mentioned the uh, the uh, uh, of the the director for for Boys Don't Cry, right. um, who again it was, it was not just that they like protested or, or objected to her. They put on her podium when she went to speak, like "F you, you." Be, I don't know if we can sw swear on the with the with C-SPAN rolling, but like really like graphic horrible things. And then they they screamed these at her to stop her from talking. Again, all she did was make like a pro transgender film, like it was a film in good standing with the left. Um, so a, lo a, lot of, uh, a lot of what you know, Jane has said about, uh, for instance, the right being bad on free speech, I completely agree with and co-sign, and it's just like that doesn't surprise me. And some of the, and the efforts like on the left to, be, to, stop people, to stop people also on the left from speaking. Um, like there, there just uh, uh, last week I wrote about um, a high school in, uh, in San Francisco where there, you know, we, we think of, again, the conservatives, the religious conservatives in particular, as the ones who want to censor uh, art that is offensive, uh, which is true. That hasn't stopped happening. The religious conservatives are better, very bad on art censorship issues. Uh, but here is a mural in a public school that was painted by a leftist in the 1940s um, about George Washington. And this painter um, hated the idea that, uh, that George Washington was being portrayed as this saintly figure in all the students' textbooks. And he wanted to portray you know, the truth, which is that the, the, the founders you know, sent our forces to, to steal the, the land from Indians and to kill them, and we had a bad history with slavery and all that, and so that is reflected in his painting. Um, a painting that now like leftist members of the San Francisco community are trying to get repainted at a cost of $600,000 to the school district uh, because it's, a, it's problematic because it depicts violence against Native American people. Which is like again, that was the point of the painting <laughs> was to show that yes, like we're not gonna we're not gonna we're not gonna um, uh, whitewash like actual American history. So it's that kind of like absurdity um, that has become really prevalent that um, that is concerning me. So that wasn't exactly addressing your question, but I just wanted to like but we're not just talking about like the rights of Nazis to speak on campus, yeah. but like the rights of and interesting progressive people to like do good things. And I, and I really want to underline that because I actually am I'm working on an article called The Hate Speech Non Sequitur because I keep on going to talks and being kind of like, what the hell does hate speech have to do with why the Rutgers newspaper just got defunded by conservatives? Like, what, what, how does it relate to so many of the cases I actually deal with on campus? Because if you think all of this is about Richard Spencer, you should know that like in my, in my career, there's only been one person <laughs> like Richard Spencer and he doesn't show up on that, on that many campuses. So if you look at our 10 worst uh, schools for free speech list, you're gonna find some incredibly tame, uh, t uh, tame speech that actually has gotten people in trouble in the past and right, left, and center. Sometimes it's just an administrator who seems to have it out for a particular administrator. Now, what can you do when Richard Spencer comes to campus? I do think that the best example of the way you make friends and influence people while protesting horrible people, um, the, the best example of that is when the Westboro Baptist Church decided to go after my beloved Comic-Con in San Diego. Um, look that up on, on, on Facebook. They completely made fun of them. It was, it, 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 uh, pro counter protesters uh, outnumbered uh, the, the Westboro Baptist per pe Church people, you know, probably 100 to one of them each. It was creative, it was memorable, it was funny, and it was just the exact right way that you, um, uh, you, you should approach some of, uh, some, of, some of these people. I also highly recommend you find the video. There was like a Klan march, um, and someone followed them with a tuba. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And just started doing like, well, doo, doo, well, doo, doo, yeah, I saw that. that was, and I'm just that like, was, that's that it. Very... That's all I need to do. That's yep. it. Like, that's I, I'm like, I wish that we could have known about this in like 1964 because I, just I following clan members with tubas. <laughs> yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Ethan Yang, current college student and a free speech intern at the American Legislative Exchange Council. Um, so my question is. Um, what do you think should be the proper way to address or diffuse uh, students who are concerned that they are, in fact, being 
physically threatened by certain types of speech or ideas. This audience really wants answers. Yeah. I mean, well, I think <laughs> I, I've got some thoughts on that because I think you know when you when I've had um, you know my own college experience when you have someone who is coming to campus who is you know I'm gay and so when someone comes to campus who is virulently homophobic, I understand that level of threat. Like there is something to be said about like imagine that you're going to dinner and all you're trying to do is just go to dinner and it turns out that the next table is someone who hates you really, really, really hates you. And they're not at your table. But they're just talking a lot about, in, like, in the third person, about how terrible you are and how immoral you are. And it would be just better if you just didn't exist. And I think for uh, some students on campus, you know, especially when you know, the idea of that kind of speech, you know, it is difficult. And I, don't, you know, I mean that to say that like, I think that there is a space to say, like, I understand that that's really hard. You know, and I've dealt with that when, you know, when I remember there were a couple of times on campus in which, you know, you'd, you didn't even have to attend the event to just have posters about the event just talking about how, like, you know, are basically positing, like, well, on the one side, here's gay person. On the other side, here's a person who thinks gay people should be murdered. Let's take both sides. Like, there's a sense of, like, yeah, that kind of sucks. <laughs> it hurts. But I also think that that's the time to activate your own free speech. You know, when you are feeling injured or hurt or threatened, that's the time to go like talk about that in a, you know, in a forum and talk about why and talk about what's the best thing to do about that. You know, I think that that's something that was really done very effectively during, uh, you know, in the 1990s and 2000s in kind of the fight for marriage equality, for example. You know, there are a lot of people who, instead of responding to the people who told us that we were terrible and evil, they didn't respond by trying to stop their speech. They responded with their own form of speech. They responded with stories about like same-sex couples with children. Yeah. They responded with same-sex couples like you know who had been together for 60 years. They responded with their own forms of speech to basically nullify the argument. And so by the time you know, by the time Obergefell that decision was made four years ago today, you had a vast societal shift in how this issue was portrayed. Not because anyone's speech got shut down. You know, nobody tried to stop Maggie Gallagher from you know, making up arguments about what LGBT people are like. People just kept throwing more arguments, real like arguments, more speech in. So I think you know, when you're feeling threatened on a college campus, that's something, you know, I've been there. But I think to respond to that with more speech, respond with why, respond with why that's wrong, respond with, you know, I am here to talk about my own experiences. And you, you don't even have to give them the oxygen of responding to them. Just come up with your own affirmative speech. I think that's how, that's how I would deal with that on a college campus today. Uh, and, and for for me, the, the thing that I, 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 you know, frankly, to be very colloquial about it, I find really messed up is that the evidence is extraordinarily clear that we're seeing higher rates of anxiety, depression, and suicide for incoming classes starting around 2012. You know, when we started noticing it, it ended up being much, much worse than we thought. And when people ask me these kind of questions, I'm kind of like, could we? First thing we have to do is stop making it much, much worse. Because if you have people who are already anxious and depressed show up on campus, and you say oh, by the way, this person that you wouldn't know about is gonna be on campus, we're, we're here for you when you have your predictable breakdown because frankly, people are very fragile and there's nothing we can really do for you other than um, warn you about it, uh, is setting up a, um, a uh, self-fulfilling prophecy. And I think that's what we're doing, is we're teaching a generation um, of students the habits of anxious and depressed people and then wondering why they're anxious and depressed, partially when we also tell them, oh, and by the way, uh, you'll be broken forever if, this, if you actually pass a certain point of, 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 um, of, of, of experiencing something that's too negative. Um, so I think that we have to start a lot earlier doing no harm. In terms of this, the speech versus violence distinction, that's something you have to actually be taught because I will sometimes have students go, oh my God, you, you, uh, I just realized this, I'm so clever, I just realized that this is just a societal invention. And it's like, of course it's a societal invention that we make a major distinction between, free uh, between the expression of opinion and action, but it's one of the best inventions we've ever come up with. 
And that has to be explained to people, because like when they start arguing that, oh, there's no real distinction between violence and speech, I'm like, well, welcome to the 13th century. Welcome to the rest of human history, when we chop off the heads of dissenters, or, may, or, or, if we're, or if they're very lucky, just make them leave our village. Um, so th some of the stuff, they just have to be taught. And some of it, I really think that in some ways, Haidt and I are taking like the mental health crisis on campus almost more seriously, because it seems like we're committed to doing things that actually will almost are guaranteed to make students more isolated, more depressed, uh, more anxious, um, uh, and thinking that somehow that's going to fix things. Yeah, I, and I would just add, um, one of the arguments I encountered uh, sort of against the free speech position from the students um, is that the, because there are power imbalances, we should not have free speech. Um, so they're saying, you know, if you're on this, this platform, you have all this privilege that I, that I lack, we're not, and you, we and we exist in some kind of free speech ethos. It's not. We're not actually talking to each other, or we're not capable of talking to each other until we uh, we erode or destroy these barriers of privilege, and then we could have free speech. But until we do that, you know, you can't. You have to. Uh, if I, if I have in in unequal power relationship to you, maybe your speech should be suppressed or not really cared about, so that mine can be lifted up and heard or something like that. Um, of course, the my rebuttal to that is. I mean, how could we possibly decide or give power to some uh, authority to adjudicate who should be allowed to speak and what and how much privilege or power do you have over this person? I mean, there's one thing that I think the activists just do not think about or rarely concede, or maybe they would concede if they were, were, were challenged on it, but uh, privilege and power are situational. There can be situations where, I mean, you can get, you can get a, a relatively, uh, 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 Disprivileged people can get like a major CEO of a company fired if they all uh, 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 team up on them on social media. Um, you can get, like we can get authors to cancel their books. Um, of course, in most cases, the CEO or the executive or the book author does have more uh, power and privilege than you, but it, it's situational. Um, so there, there can't be. It would be impossible to design a policy or give power to some organization or governmental thing to decide. Um, how to, who gets to speak um, a, until the relationships um, are equal. Obviously, free speech is actually a, 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 a regime and a culture and an ethos and a legal system of total or virtually total free speech is how we work out who has these privileges and, and what other rights we should afford people to, to equalize society. Uh, but we need to actually like have a total free speech regime to actually have those conversations. So at the rate we're going, I think we have time for one more question, all the way in the back. Ouch. All the way in the back. <laughs> no, it's okay. Uh, Ilya Soman, George Mason University. I agree with the, the vast majority of points all of the speakers have made, but I do have one question regarding intersectionality, and that is how important is it really if at least in the extreme form that you described, since as, uh, as Robbie also said, uh, uh, only a few people actually ha hold all of the sets of beliefs to go with it. So it may, and even major events of the political left, including Women's March, uh, occur in ways that don't follow these principles. So I wonder if instead it might be more like something that was a big deal when I was young, uh, deconstructionism. People said there was a big uproar about it, but it turned out that hardly anybody believed in deconstructionism other than uh, some radical left academics in the humanities. So it turned out not to be a big deal for society as a whole. And I wonder if maybe intersectionality, at least in this extreme form, might be the same way. There are some radical academics and students who really believe in it, uh, but uh, it's ultimately sort of a fringe movement. Um, well, that might be the case. So it's clearly very important uh, because it's, the, I mean, the word is simply used um, uh, so commonly when, when not only just the sort of radical activists, but I think when, when most young people talk about social, you'd probably agree with that. Uh, well, well I think you. it's, you know, when I spoke, I actually interviewed uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, who came up with the idea of intersectionality, mm -hmm. yep. and she personally was just like, I don't know how this all happened. <laughs> you know, she right. wrote this paper for the University of Chicago talking about, specifically about using intersectionality as a lens in the law, in non-discrimination law, because she saw how many times black women endured, in a couple of specific cases, endured forms of discrimination that only happened to black women. For example, you, I think you talk about, uh, DeBraffenberg, yeah, yeah, in yeah. 
in the book, but there are a couple of specific instances, and I think one of the things about intersectionality is that you know when I wrote the piece about it and talked about how conservatives were responding, as you said, pretty much everybody's like, yeah, people are complicated. Everybody can, you know, if you are, say, like an Ethiopian Jew, your experiences are going to be different from an Ashkenazi Jew, or if you're a woman who is in part of the LDS church, your experiences of being a Mormon are going to be different than a man who's a Mormon. I think that's the, the baseline of intersectionality, but I would actually kind of compare it to um, how diversity became kind of a buzzword that everyone used without really knowing what that meant at all. You know, when you start like, um, you've seen like now 2020 candidates talking about intersectionality, but using it as like, oh, this movement will be intersectional, where that doesn't make sense linguistically. Mm -hmm. Like, it just doesn't make sense. But so I think that, you know, I could see that as we get further away from what Professor Crenshaw was trying to talk about and more towards, you know, I brought up kind of the administrative state on college campuses and more towards, like, we're getting very close to someone hi hiring, like, an intersectionality coordinator that will pay, like, $150,000. Sweet gig. Yeah, uh, it's going to be amazing. But I think that's the that's where I kind of see it. Going. Yeah, and I just so I just add one, so my, one of my issues with it is so, so it's saying again, and this is, does not impugn the specific theory that there are different sources of oppression and they work in conjunction. It, like that's I agree with that. That's sort of obvious in some sense. Um, but that so the person, generally speaking, you should have more authority and power in an activist circle if you have more sources of oppression mm -hmm. um, in, infringing on you because the, the oppressed are the experts on their own oppression, um, which I suspect is part of the worsening mental health issue on campus because if you want to sort of have status of authority, I mean, you can't it's harder to fake some of these categories of oppression, like race and gender, um, which are, are, less, are less easily mutable, but you can say you have a mental health problem. Um, and in fact, it's very common for activists to do that, to even like post in their biographies of themselves on websites, like the first thing they tell you about themselves is that they have PTSD or they have trauma or, or something like that. Again, I, 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 I'm glad we've destigmatized these things and these people should certainly get the help they need, but you know, like I interviewed a professor for my book who said that she teaches acting, and every single one of her students at some point said they had PTSD at a very prestigious liberal arts college. Like, there's no way, right? There's no actual way they all have PTSD. Um, so that's a, so so giving activists incentive to see themselves as suffering from mental health problems um, strikes me as bad. Yeah. And uh, what, what it, intersectionality itself is a theory. Now, it, it, the power of things is theories, as they get detached from what they actually mean, is universal, essentially. Like, I, I was just talking about how I grew up with Catholics. who's like, well, I believe that you have a direct relationship with God. I don't really believe in the Pope, but I'm Catholic. And I'm like, no, you're not Catholic. <laughs> or I'm a Marxist, but I don't believe the, the, the government should own the means of production. It's just like, ugh. So intersectionality, what I, when we talk about it, we often get people who really believe in it to be kind of like, well, that's not really what it's saying. And in our book, Coddling the American Mind, we actually think it's like, well, yeah, it's kind of a banal observation in some ways, or they're perfectly valid that your, your identities intersect. But here's why I think it is actually kind of a big deal. Um, combined with privilege theory uh, basic, and stackability, that essentially that there's something um, that if you have more sort of zones of oppression, um, that you have more status in certain senses, it's too tempting of a rhetorical tactic. So uh, the reason why I ended up being very skeptical of this is in overwhelmingly wealthy, white, uh, hyper-educated circles that I went to, that went to Burning Man in San Francisco, um, this is when I first started being called out for my privilege by rich, white dudes. Um, o over and over again, and if it actually has something that lets you win an argument every time, it's gonna that version of it, that that version of it that actually really does alienate people, where it's kind of like you know someone shouting at you about like how can you understand this? Tell me about your trauma, and then I'm forced to actually tell people about my trauma. Um, that's what actually I think is gonna have some staying power. People will call it intersectionality, even though it's something that I think Crenshaw has actually uh, denounced herself as being un unconstructive. Right. But I do think that version of it, since it is so. Um, it's so easy to get uh, to, to create that perfect rhetorical fortress, as, as I call it. Um, it's gonna it's gonna be around for a while, is my guess. It's a, but it's a guess. And we are just a couple of minutes before the scheduled end of the session. Is there anyone with a really quick question? Yes. Martini. 
I'm sorry, I'm sorry. We'll, we'll, yes, I, I'm sorry to have passed you over earlier. So quick question, very quick. Uh, first of all, I want to, you know, regarding uh, freedom of speech, I tell over here, I see that the Cato or other institutes, they are using the panel as indoctrination rather than allowing the people ask about the talk about freedom of speech. The other issue I wanted to ask is, uh, don't you think that since World War II and mostly since Vietnam War, the whole issues of freedom of speech, freedom of, uh, I mean, freedom, justice, democracy, all of things, as uh, Mr. Lukanov, Lukanov said, is manipulated by rich to divert attention of the real issues. The real issues that they were able in during this time to 1% to have 99% of the whole asset of this country and have the other people involved this uh, different issues of the sexual freedom, freedom of so on, so on, so on. So I just don't want to go through that. Uh, that was my question. I think that these issues matter for everyone. You know, I think that the idea, you know, I hear this sometimes from folks like, you know, why are these issues at all important when the climate is burning and we're all going to die? And I'm like, well, while the climate is burning and we're all going to die, we still have to be able to talk to each other. <laughs> right. Like, we need, like, you know, if we've got 12 years, it's going to be 12 years of us having conversations with each other. And then after the 12 years, we can get to, like, zombie murder time. <laughs> but I think that you know, these issues are important. It's not a distraction to talk about how we talk to each other about the most important issues. Issues of you know, sexuality and race that resulted in, you know, we're just barely removed from a time in which the federal government banned LGBT people from working for any gov federal ed entity. You know, people, Frank you know, and that, you know, and it's because of heroes like Frank Kameny, and it's because of a lot of people that, that it, who spoke up, who said no. You know, and I, I think about the original Mattachine Society, people who were marching outside the White House in 1965, carrying signs that said, I am a homosexual, which was a crime. And you know, you think about the people who spoke, who you know, the reason why we have the right to have this conversation today is because people took advantage of their free speech. So I don't think it's a distraction from bigger issues. I think that the speech that we can have about you know how much of the media is controlled by just a few, you know, tiny actors, that's free speech too. Yeah. You know, being able to talk about that, the work that you know, Glenn Greenwald is doing at The Intercept, that's possible because of his free speech, which right now, you know, is under threat in Brazil. Yep. And I think it's important that, like, these are, this is not a distraction. And, you know, the issues of how people want to live and whom people want to love and what people look like, those are all, like, deeply integral to the human experience. And I think that when we talk, when, I think that sometimes, you know, and I get this a lot from folks on the left that like, no, 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 that's a distraction. We have to just talk about class. And I'm like, well, you know, historically, class and all of these issues have intersected in some really interesting ways. And the only way to talk about them is to talk about them with speech that is free. As, as moderator, I would be remiss not to say the following. We at uh, Cato, hold panels on a wide variety of different topics. And if this one wasn't to your liking or if it seemed less than important to you, I would encourage you to come to our other panels. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, when it comes to freedom of speech as, as a distraction, now is this indoctrination? Um, I, I don't know, like do, do we, should we disagree more? Uh, possibly, I can figure out some things I disagree with Robbie on. Um, uh, but when it comes to freedom of speech as a distraction, my God, um, freedom of speech is not normal. It does not come normally to people. It is not most of human history. We deal with dissenters, like I said, by crucifying them, chopping off their heads, making them drink hemlock, um, and that's normal. That, that's part of our inherent tribalism. Freedom of speech is rare. 
it's fragile um, and, it, and it needs to be protected, partially because it is so consistently the solution. Um, Cass Sunstein came out with a good book called Conformity. Now, of course, people criticize Sunstein because he writes the same book every year, essentially, and a lot of, recycles a lot of old material, but his points are nonetheless valid. And there's this great um, uh, 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 a series of essays, I, be I believe, um, published at the end of World War II that explains that one of the reasons why we were able to succeed against Nazis and about the Japanese Empire was partially because we could fix errors more quickly, because we actually had some jackass going, that's ah, never gonna work, you know, like that's a bad plan. That actually, um, not only does it, uh, does it improve your ability to respond to threats, it lets you know what the threats and problems are in the freaking first place. And when you look at the history of, of societies where there aren't free speech, they do incredibly stupid things because nobody thought to actually say the emperor has no clothes. So freedom of speech, it absolutely, absolutely, we're taking it for granted right now. Um, but we will be very, very sorry when it's gone. I, and uh, I'll just, I guess probably in closing, I'll just add, um, I, uh, you know, I uh, occasionally wish uh, the activists would focus on um, different things than uh, some of the issues that seem very slight uh, or, or not as uh, significant to me, uh, often because I think I would agree with them if their activism was concentrated on, on uh, different things. I have a brief um, section in the book uh, titled, uh, I believe it's titled Deafening Silence. It's about the anti-war movement as oh, it exists yeah. today, <laughs> which uh, doesn't exist at all, uh, faded into nothingness as if Thanos snapped his fingers or something, <laughs> um, uh, maybe a decade ago, um, it, it, despite us still being involved in, in many wars, um, maybe less flashy, the news media is less preoccupied with them. But uh, so it, it's, my, it's my agreement with, with some of the things that progressives want, or progressive activists should want, on paper at least, that causes me to, to want them to be better or to criticize their tactics, not from like some sort of warped conservative desire to see them fail. Please join me in thanking our panel one more time. Which, uh, yeah. I feel slightly funny clapping for a panel that I'm on, I but I, I really, that's why yeah. I try to look at the people.